you know where you're joining in from. Ooh, I can see people commenting to the video we just watched. How are we all do doing today? Today is the sixth session of the Arts in Medicine, Global Arts in Medicine Fellowship, rather. My name is Franca Ekoma. I'm a 2020 Arts in Medicine Fellow and one of the team members for this fellowship. Today, I would be your co-host together with, is Rodney on the call? Rodney? Yeah, I'm Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I can hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Rodney Chimundu from Uganda at 2020. Hello, as well, from the Arts in Medicine. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy to get to be your host, and uh, Franka will be my host. And yeah, I'm excited for today's session, uh, which is design thinking and health innovation. And uh, we have our facilitator here today. Uh, yeah, she's, uh, you've seen him uh, before. And uh, yeah, I think I'll go ahead and introduce him. Sorry. If yeah, if it's, and uh, yeah, uh, you've seen him before. Sorry. Yeah, today, today, I'll be a little bit louder. Today, we're having a facilitator. His name is uh, Dominic Campbell, and uh, I'll introduce him. I'll read his bio briefly. Rodney, Mr. Dominic is a co founder. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, please. Your network is crackly, so we can barely hear what you're saying. I think I'll just take it up from here. Okay. Did you hear that? Yes. So um, my co-host is meant to be Rodney, calling in from Uganda. And he's also a 2020 Arts in Medicine, Arts in Medicine Fellow. Today's session is titled design thinking and health innovation, and is going to be handled by someone we've already met, someone who has taken a session prior about two weeks ago. And before I call him up to the virtual podium, I would like you to just meet him again. There's no harm in meeting people a second time, is there? So you have to, yes. Our facilitator for today's session is Dominic Camel, and he's the co-founder of Creative Aging International, which encourages people to fall in love with, with their older selves by using creativity and entertainment to inform, sorry about that, to inform individual understanding and adapt systemic behavior. Our facilitator is also a cultural producer, maybe he'll tell us what that means when he starts, who has worked in Europe, Australia, and the United States. He was previously an artistic director of Ireland St. Patrick's Festival, a co-creator of the Theater of Symposia series for the Abbey Theater, and director of Belting Festival, I hope I pronounced that well, Ireland's groundbreaking celebration of creativity as we age. As an Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health at the Global Brain Health Institute in Trinity College, Dublin, Mr. Dominic Campbell is prototyping unique collaborations between artists, 
communities, and scientists to create the possibility for republics of care. And he's doing this by engaging creatives with the social determinants of health to challenge the dominant narratives of need, othering, and belonging while creating new rituals for contemporary aging. I repeat, today he shall be taking the session design thinking and health innovation. You have the virtual stage, Mr. Dominic Campbell. Franca, thank you. Rodney, thank you very much. It's very nice to be back with everybody today. Um, hello, you might just in the chat, uh, let me know where you are listening in from. And while you're doing that, um, I want to ask you a few things. I want to ask that if when we're talking like this, and you can, if it's possible for you, please uh, stay uh, on camera. It's very nice to see people's faces. Uh, obviously, if you can't, you can't. If your technology lets you down or the electricity goes off, or then that's not a problem either. Uh, if, like me, you don't like talking to yourself, hide yourself for you. It really helps. Um, what else? We might, we will have some little discussions. So uh, when we're having discussions, we can try unmuting and see how busy it gets. But if it gets really noisy, just mute yourself. Um, mind your airtime, because we don't have an awful lot of time, though we have precious time. And uh, sometimes it goes quiet. Just be comfortable with that, because the most important thing I think today is to be kind to yourself and to all those other people that have joined us. Uh, and I'm delighted that we have people from, oh, Manali, hey, how are you doing? From Alexandra, people from uh, Nigeria, fantastic. Tanzania, hello, welcome. Uh, where else are people calling in from? Cairo, lovely. And yes, Giza, fantastic. That is some fantastically exciting spread. And what that means is, you all work in very different types of environment and contexts. So uh, just while I'm doing this, if I do the gallery, yeah. Can you either give me a quick wave if you are, if you think of yourself as a medic, if you're a medical professional, if you are a healthcare worker, just give me a wave, just put your hands up. Yeah, it's quite a lot of you, that's good. Or give me a, an emoji. While I look through the four pages, just give me a big wave. Yay, great. Okay. Now then, who is a, who thinks of themselves as an artist? Who is an artist? Who is a maker? Give me a big wave. Yeah. Give it lots of love. Fantastic. Okay. There's Frank is going both. Nice. I like that. Uh, so we've got artists, we've got healthcare workers, we've got makers who think of all sorts. We have people from Nigeria and Tanzania and Costa Rica and Egypt. We've got a really rich group of people, uh, rich in experience, experts at being yourself. And so what I want to do today is to guide you through tools, many of which I think you will already have. You just might call them other things that will help you as you start to make uh, arts and health projects. So I want to know one or two other things before I do that. First thing is, um, those of you that can make it on camera, if you do lots and lots mm -hmm. of arts and health work, give me a wave by putting your hand at the top of the screen. If you do a little bit in the middle, not a lot at the bottom. Okay, so we've got some people up there. Yeah, we've got some people down there. It's good. Okay, so lots of arts and health work. Carmen, yeah, can see you. Susie, yeah, some. Dr. Dahlia kind of in the middle. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 yeah, yeah, that's good. Some of what you do is, some of what you do isn't. Great, it gives me a really good sense and it's really nice to kind of connect with people making arts and health work. Uh, Eki says, artists, medics and facilitators facilitate broker in between the two. Fantastic, yeah. So the way that I'm gonna do this is I am gonna give you way too much information for two hours. Afterwards, you will get a, PDF of the PowerPoint that I use, which has lots and lots of links. You can then dive in and spend some time. It's a, hopefully what I've done is put together a really useful tool for you to take a deeper dive. Um, what else is useful? The other useful thing is each other. Hopefully you've already discovered that you are 
a living library of experience and expertise. Um, so do draw on each other. Um, the way that I've structured this is I'm going to give you some examples, examples of what's possible. I'm going to give you then some maps, I suppose, some ideas about process, and then some tools to help you to think. And the purpose of this is that collectively, what all of those tools do is they encourage you to ask questions. They are to help you uh, dream, try out, make, and do. Um, they're to help you question your own understanding, maybe where we're starting from already, whether it's more in the health world or more in the creative world. Uh, and they're to help us all, including me, do better. So, what I really want to know as you go on and develop your projects and tools is what you're learning. Because I think collective learning is where this is the most exciting, uh, the most exciting area. So anything else I need to ask you? Um, there were two things that I sent you a little email about. Uh, one was if there was anything from the leadership session, which was two weeks ago um that you'd like to know more about if you can put that in the chat i'll try and get around to that as we go on uh, and the other two questions will come up as we go through this session so one was about where and how is health made and the second question is what's the healthcare or well-being challenge you want to most address uh, and we might just take some little examples of that so can i ask in the chat um is there, what's the, what's the healthcare challenge that you'd like to most address? If you can put it in the chat, that'd be great. Or if you put a hand up, I'll try and, uh, you might have an ask. And maybe you don't know what it is yet. That's good. Anybody know? Anybody got a really particular, I want to address this thing? Making life more sheer fun for paediatric cancer patients. Yep. Poor health seeking behavior of Nigerians. Uh, since the beginning of the journey, you learned about exciting existing projects in Ireland that did not exist. The tourism board will love me. Um, okay, they're good. Anybody got any other ideas? Any other things that you'd like to? Accessibility to relevant information, says Owen. Yep. How do people find what it is that people need? Uh, academic stress in the educational system, work stress, yeah. Work with children with cancer, dietitian, uh, I want to ease things for those children. Fab, love to know about how art and health can help with behavior, the challenge in healthcare se sectors, addressing the stigma, around people living or born with terminal diseases. That's actually would address that directly. Drug abuse, misuse, work with special needs children who are autistic and non-verbal, fab. Uh, depression and anxiety originating from health diseases. So this is people, I guess, who have a disease, have an illness, and then become depressed and anxious. Disillusionment and disengagement among children. Cool, great. So some of you had really clear ideas, an area maybe that you want to explore. Some of you, at the beginning of that, all of these tools are uh, hopefully gonna be really useful to you as you plan and strategize and think. But I wanna start with examples. So, excuse me while I do the sharing screen thing. Uh, I'm going to do the sharing screen thing and then, yeah, I will present some examples and then I'll make spaces for, for conversations and exploring. But if you have thoughts in, as I'm talking, put things in the chat. And sometimes I get a bit too excited and I talk too fast. So I will try and slow down. Okay. So just move the bits around. Okay. Yeah, so we want you to, we want to help you dream, think, plan and do. Okay, design thinking. 
What is design thinking? Design thinking is a creative approach to problem solving. It's simply one line definition. It's a linear process for problem solving in stages. So quite often uh, you might have a sense of what it is that you want to address or to do. I want to work with nonverbal autistic children. Uh, I want to address uh, stress and anxiety arising from a diagnosis. But that's a really big, complicated ambition. So how do you break that down? Well, one way is to use the design thinking processes. Uh, and people describe them in slightly different ways, but they are usually observe, look, define. So what exactly is it I can see? What is it exactly that we can do here? Imagine, simply imagine, test, test and trial, and then adapt. Um, we'll get into that as we go. Why is it useful, I think, is a really good place to start. I think it's useful because some problems are really complicated. They're, they're quite often known as wicked and sticky problems. So they might be, um, let me give you some examples. They might be uh, an illness that comes with an associated stigma. So somebody has a particular condition, People stay away from them because they have that condition. People avoid them. People are afraid of them. It might be a mental health condition. It might be Alzheimer's. It could be autism. It could be that people are nonverbal. And therefore, that individual's challenges become more and more complicated. Or it could be um, about health, access to fresh water, and poverty. So, which bit of those? is the place to start. How do, you, how do you unpick all of those really challenging, interconnected, interrelated issues? How can you do something that moves the dial in that direction positive? So I'm going to start with some examples because I think examples are a good place to start. Um, I'm going to start by talking about hospitals and healthcare centres, buildings, places that we go for health. Um, I'm going to talk about murals and singing in hospitals, but I'm also going to talk about what, I've, what I nickname, what I, what I call ninja projects. So these are little stealth-like things, very simple little things that have uh, a big effect. They help things to really, really move. Um, and then I'm going to talk about health outside of hospitals. So this is just to give you some examples to get us started. I'm going to start close to home with the Arts and Medicine Project. This is uh, the uh, Innovate Arts and Health Innovation Hub in Lagos. This is it, um, what, this time, no, early last year, when Conley uh, first started sharing some images of it. Um, so it's a mental health unit. This is what it looked like. This is what it looks like now. Let's do the back and forth. This is what it looked like before. This is what it looks like now. And really, what's happened there is somebody sat and looked at it and went, this isn't really very inspiring. This, is, this is, doesn't look like a healthy environment. So if I bring a bit of creativity and some paint and some care, then I can change the way that it looks. And simply changing the way that it looks has really positive impacts on the people that go there as patients, but also the people that go there as staff. If you're working in a beautiful environment, you feel so much better than if you're working in a place that, that is difficult and challenging. So some of these interventions are small. They might seem small, but they have really significant impact. Um, this is a choir that meets in a hospital um, in Dublin. It meets in um, the section, the, the geriatric section, the section that's the uh, gerontology. So the section for diagnosis of Alzheimer's or um, uh, issues with gait or, or uh, heart health are mainly what happens there. So when people go into this building, they usually go in in a, in a state of anxiety. They're nervous. They're going for a diagnosis. There's something challenging that isn't working for them. And what we did here was we got to know people that lived in the area of the hospital. We found... Uh, a, a group singing teacher and once a week on a Monday morning 
uh, we invited people to come into the hospital to sing. Normally, these would be people that would come in to be a patient, but we just invited them into a singing group. And so we set that singing group up like a heartbeat in the hospital on a Monday. And as people were coming in to wait for their appointments and they were nervous, they could sit and you know, watch their clots and wait for their appointment, or they could sit and listen to people singing. And so we started to change the use of that hospital on the Monday morning. It wasn't just the place you went for diagnosis, it was also the place you went to sing. And of that group of initially about 20 or 30 people, 70% uh, of them had been in the hospital as a patient in the last year because they were all older people. And as that choir became a heartbeat on a Monday, gradually we worked out how to bring patients down from the wards that are, that are upstairs above. And so the choir became a place where if you were a patient, often on a long-term stay, you could go and join the choir. It had that addition of helping people feel part of a, a bigger world than the, the shrinking world of a patient. And occasionally they would do concerts that invited in people. And it was a little intervention that gradually had quite big and significant change. And I include it here alongside other projects based around singing, based around group voice, which are much more about a particular illness. So this is a project by Victoria Hume called The Singing Hospital. It's based in uh, the UK somewhere. And what they did was they said, there is a particular uh, series of conditions and illnesses to do with uh, lungs and heart. And those particular illnesses which make people short of breath, which don't provide oxygen to the blood, would benefit from some exercise that would help the lungs. And so they created um, singing groups, singing for health groups that were really specific. And what they were doing at the same time was, was making this bridge, as somebody said in the chat, uh, this link between a creative approach and a healthcare approach. So really it's a, a public health intervention. And these projects, which have uh, clearly defined illnesses and clearly defined ambitions, knitting together uh, for therapeutic benefits, but also for, for an agency, for instance, um, become increasingly sophisticated. So uh, you'll see on the bottom of this slide, there's a little link for this project. And I put on the slides the links so that you can read more about them. Um, the, the most um, involved versions of those now are projects like Hearing the Voice. So this is interdisciplinary voice hearing research. Hearing the Voice is about people that hear voices. And um, for some people that's a mental health condition, for some people it's other things. In order to understand that world better, in order to be able to provide people with the tools that they need to help them navigate this, um, requires many different disciplines working together. And so in that project, the creative role is equal to the uh, healthcare researchers role. So it's creative research. It's a very different relationship, but what they're also, what the artists are also doing that, what creatives are also doing that is providing the mechanic, the way that people connect with each other. So you've got something quite straightforward, I change the environment. You've got something quite straightforward, I put the singing group into a hospital. You've got a next level of complexity where you start to knit together um, a particular condition and a particular arts response. And then you've got a next level where you're, you're both as, as creatives and as healthcare professionals diving into this, into a new area that isn't perfectly understood, which is not clear. And I'm going to end this section on hospitals with, a, with um, an example called the Design and Dignity Programme. So at the moment, one of the things I do when I'm not talking to you is I work with the Hospice Foundation in Ireland. And the Hospice Foundation, um, their focus is on death, dying, grief and loss. So they work with formal hospitals, acute hospitals, residential care hospitals and community in very different ways. And the Design and Dignity Programme came about because they realised that 
uh, Irish hospital didn't look like these pictures. And that part of what happens is in a hospital, whether it's an acute or a residential care hospital, is people die. People have to fend, face the end of life. There are these difficult conversations where staff say that an intervention may not be useful, where people are, families are told that their loved one is dying, where you as a patient are told that you have to prepare for the end of life, and they're really difficult. And so how could creative teams work with the hospital institution to make that process better? And what did better mean? So that's where it began, and it took about 10 years to get to the stage that it's at now. And one of the things they did at the very beginning was really make a map. What were the challenges of, for this project in those hospital spaces? And they said, well, one of the challenges, we need to change what the space is for. Uh, but we need to do that within the way that the hospitals work, within their guidelines and their policies. So I can't just wander in and decide to paint the wall because you know, someone's gonna come in from security and throw me out. And I can't just move all the furniture around because other people use that building. So, so how do we work with the hospital? How do we make a bridge between creative change and the way that a hospital functions? And obviously a hospital isn't just the care staff, it isn't just the doctors, it's also the cleaners, it's also the security company, it's also the people that process information, it's also the building contractors who actually do the work of physical change. Um, so if we want this intervention to work, we want to make nicer spaces, we want to reduce the burden of telling people difficult news. Um, if we want to make these better spaces for end of life then we need lasting commitment financially but also we just need the commitment of the organization we need the organization the hospital to say yes this is important to us and we're going to do this so that's a long long process so how do we stick it together so at the very beginning this is the work they were doing they were looking at how do we make this aspiration this aim part of what a hospital will do in the very long term and so they started quite simply. They started with little changes to spaces, not so different from the work that Conway showed um, with that first slide, the before and after slide. They took spaces that already existed, in this case, a chapel. They commissioned artists, in this case, a, a, someone that works with glass, to, to change the, the feeling and the look of the space. Um, and those were the kind of simple interventions. And those little interventions had really big effects. And some of the effects weren't actually on the patients. They were on the staff. And what they realized as they, this project developed was that staff are really important for an arts and health project if you're trying to make them last. Because it's very difficult to have a conversation with someone to tell them that they're dying. It's very embarrassing to do that in a busy corridor in a room that isn't appropriate it's really hard to connect with family if you have to tell them that their loved one is dying and it's even worse to do that in a terrible space in a busy corridor so actually by making these spaces what was beginning to happen is that it was having positive effects on the staff on their pride but also actually on their health and the staff were the um, means the tool the, the, that be, they became the ambassadors for this project. So each individual staff member became in their own way an ambassador. They talked about the, positive, the project positively. They explained in their own language, in their own way, why this was important. They generated interest across the hospital in having these kind of spaces. And in turn, that led to the corporate, the institution of the hospital commitment to end of life care. Um, so sometimes those interventions, you don't quite know how they're going to develop. And when we look again at the phases of design, you'll see why that's uh, important. 
so as the project evolved, what they re what they recognised was important was was trying to involve as many people as possible, what they called multidisciplinary committees. So it might involve the cleaner, it might involve the security, it might involve the director, it might involve the staff, so that everybody was involved in socialising this idea. Um, having clear guidelines, this is what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it is important. In this particular project, using somebody from outside, an architect who had an interest was important, but it was as important that all the staff were involved in little things, seemingly little things, like naming the room, naming the space, giving it a, a, a name that was their choice because then they owned it. It wasn't a project that came in from this group outside. It was something that was built with people, with the people that worked in those, uh, in those hospitals. Um, the other thing was to take people from one site to somewhere that had already been built. So, uh, so let me think. Yep. So you've made a nice space, made a nice room. You can invite somebody from another hospital to see it. And that experience of seeing it and hearing from uh, the staff that work there is possibly the most inspirational thing that can happen. Those staff become in the hospital where you've done the project. The, um, promoters of that project in uh, the next place. I see a couple of questions. I'm gonna to get to the end of this and then open it up. Um, the other thing that became apparent as the project developed was to try and make it normal. So this wasn't luxurious. This wasn't uh, an impossible project. Um, this could be something that could happen everywhere and could be sustained. And, two little things, tiny, tiny things that were incredibly important uh, helped that. One was this. So the project adopted a symbol um, based on old Celtic Irish design um, as an end of life symbol. So where this project was happening, there would be these little spirals. And that would pop up uh, on, on the information about the project. It would pop up on in all sorts of places and one of the most important was that there was a bag made for family and friends to take uh, if somebody had died in hospital then to take whatever it was that they had brought to hospital take them home before this people would just give them things in a plastic bag you know the bin liner and just having a bag where there'd been attention and a bit of care at the design and receiving the clothes or the of your loved one made such a difference in the way that the families felt respected by the hospital and so these small seemingly small interventions have huge uh, impact and effect so i'm going to pause there for a second um there's a couple of questions so i'm going to take some questions uh sekito you have your hand up. You have a question? Okay. A Kinroy, maybe? Yeah, I'm just catching up with some of the messages in the chat. It's all very positive. Okay. Um, what about places where health happens beyond hospitals? So uh, hospital street illness, but where can health be made? Um, you might stick some ideas in the chat. Um, Excuse me, Dominic. We have two people who their hands are raised. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can unmute them so they can speak. Thanks, Franca. Sikito, do you mind unmuting yourself? I just tried to unmute you now. Okay. If Sikuto isn't, I'll try Akimwe. I 
Akima, can you unmute yourself? Oh, I see that he wasn't even on the call. Akimo is having some issues with his network. Okay. I mean, I think you can go ahead. If they have any questions, they would let us know. Thank you. Okay, no problem. And Franco, thank you. Um, really helps. Um, so where where can where can health be made? Places that health might be made that are not hospitals. Uh, places where you might try and do a health intervention. Uh, Temi says community. Franca says homes. Mm -hmm. Gyms, yeah, outside sports arenas, areas, home, school, community centres, streets, schools. Schools is great, public health. Yeah, Aula, Mother Nature, trees, by the seaside, lots of schools, workplace. Workplace is a great one. Bus and train stations, I like them a lot. Public sector businesses, yeah, pitches, sports pitches, I guess, online street. Yeah, these are all good. Uh, marketplace, yeah, one of my favorite. Open green areas, yeah. So health can be made all kinds of places. Um, the next examples I'm gonna talk you through are uh, case studies from where people try and make health, but not in a healthcare setting. Um, and they're just some examples. There are lots and lots of examples out there. Um, these ones I think are useful because they start to show you a way that um, projects can join up. Uh, yeah, could be done anywhere. Pretty much, I think that's what I think now. So, just figure the slides thing out a bit. Yeah, health happens everywhere. So, we talked about community or art spaces, or schools, museums, library, street, train stations bathrooms so lots of the spaces that are not hospital spaces are really about health promotion the projects that happen there are often about health promotion whereas downstream the hospitals are often about the management of illness um, i'm going to talk about an arts club for older adults in uh, south london that was started Phew, about eight, year, eight years ago now, and I'm going to use it as an example because I think it helps us uh, make some interesting maps and think about uh, where health can happen and how it can happen. So this group, really simple. There is a, a community centre of a space uh, where people are invited to go along and to make things. In this particular case, it's, it's older adults, um, and sometimes they make arts and sometimes they make circus. So what they're not afraid of in this group is risk. What they recognize is that risk is part of living. And if you take away risk, quite often you take away the opportunity for people to explore who they are at a change stage in their life. And that change stage in their life might be because an illness has, has, has physically changed them or mentally changed them or changed their position in the world. So they are a different person than they were before the illness. Um, what this project also does, which is an unexpected health benefit, is connect people to each other in exactly the same way that the nurses became the ambassadors for design and dignity. People become the ambassadors for a better way of living. So Franca said at the beginning that a lot of what I do is about encouraging people to fall in love with their older self, because then you build a world that you want to grow older in. What happens in Southeast London is really aligned with that. And I ran that project for a couple of years, which is why I want to use it as an example. But I also want to use it because it does this. So in the medical hospital world, people would be familiar with patient pathways. This is maybe the journey of someone from accident and emergency into a particular healthcare response and then out of the hospital and maybe in the long run into some sort of therapeutic support. 
what we did with Entelechy is talk about the journey of an individual through one of the projects and how that might work like a patient pathway. So um, this is a particular individual who had had a stroke. Uh, he had been a construction worker, builder, strong man in his 60s, had a stroke, some paralysis, some confusion. He'd gone through the hospital process, he was at home, but now he was wondering who he was in the world. And he started coming to these sessions after referral from the social care team. Um, and for the first few months, he'd come along because he was curious, but he wasn't really excited by it. And he wasn't quite sure whether it was for him. And he had all sorts of like, no, I'm not sure about this, but I'll come along because I'm interested. And then he began to make friends really with uh, one of the people there who was a poet. And he just played around with words, with moving words around in sentences with cutting them up and putting them on a page in a different way, with seeing what happens when you read them. And what happens when you read them is you invest all of those strange random words with some sort of emotion. They mean something to you. He did a little reading of one of the poems that he cut up at a public event. And about a year after that, there was a little book of poems printed and he was in it. And now he goes on tour occasionally with some of the poets. And he's been in that group for about a decade, and he's become physically more frail over that time. But he's also stopped defining himself by his illness. So he is as much a poet and a writer and an explorer of ideas as he is somebody who's living with a stroke. And so that patient journey through arts, through creativity, it's a really important thing to think about when you're thinking about the projects you're going to design. And in that particular group, which was in a community centre, People were referred in by the general practitioners, by social care teams, by the voluntary sector, or they wandered in themselves or family and friends. And we were lucky we were able to do that because of South London and there's lots of resources and it's fantastic. But I mentioned this because it's important when you start to think about your projects to think about how people find you. How do they get referred in? Is it just family and friends? What's the way that you talk about your idea to other people and they talk about it to other people and other people come to find you? So there are lots of different ways that referral routes happen. Um, what I think was key to this one was this was the advert for a health intervention program. This is how it talks about itself. This is the visual language that it uses to talk about itself. It's cheeky, it's bold, it's funny. These are older adults who are not sitting in chairs being slumped, who have a sense of humour. Uh, they are very bold, actually, and very cheeky. And it's so much fun. I can see people kind of grinning. It makes you smile. Who would not want to go to something that makes you smile? So uh, these are 17, 18, 90 year olds. They have health conditions. Some people have strokes. Some people have early uh, manifestations of Alzheimer's. Some people have, lots of people have mobility issues. But if you create the opportunity to have fun, uh, it's incredibly attractive. Now, obviously, you might not do this depending on the context that you're working in. It might not be appropriate. But for them, it is. What's also appropriate for them is that their interventions and the art they make is not uh, straightforward. It's not necessarily that they're decorating and making healthcare settings beautiful. So this group talked a lot about how difficult it was for them when they got to be older that they became invisible. You'd walk down the street and people just wouldn't see you and that's a terrible thing and people who've been vibrant parts of their communities now felt that they had no say in their community and that was impacting their mental health, their sense of self, but it was also lessening the quality that they could bring to their community. Because all of these people who have fantastic, they're experts like yourself in their own experience, all their expertise was getting lost. And so uh, over time, they came up with this idea, which was on market day, somebody mentioned markets, uh, six people, six performers from this company would make a piece of theatre and the piece of theatre would look like this. It would be an old person abandoned 
in their bed in the street. And in some places this would work, and in some places if I did this in San Francisco, it wouldn't work because there are so many people living in the street. But in this place, it really worked. Because what happened was people came to the bed and said, are you okay? There was no signage, there was no explanation, there were just people abandoning the bed. And the conversations that happened around those beds uh, became incredibly important. And from that grew lots of other types of projects. So sometimes the art that you make is cheeky and bold and mischievous and, and is an idea that nobody else will think of. Uh, on the first day that this happened was market day. There were several people abandoned with people being security around. Uh, and a group of young women uh, went to the nearest place that they thought was official because it had a desk and said, uh, there is a terrible crime happening in our community. Older people are being abandoned in their street and the police came, that's actually, that is the police coming along to see. Uh, so the impacts of the projects are many and complicated and they don't necessarily work in a straight line. And over five years, what we started to do was make different groups like this in different spaces across this particular part of the city. So there would be a group on a Tuesday in the north, a group on a Wednesday in the south. There might be a group in a library. There might be a group uh, in a room in a, in a bus station. There'd be different groups. And each group had an artist. It was mostly supported by volunteers, the green dots. And the participants, in times, many, some of them became volunteers. They became uh, people that ran or, or led or supported. So uh, keeping an eye on the time. I'm going to take that idea that health happens everywhere, that the interventions can be very different and talk about the way that we've been developing that through, um, through festivals, really, through celebration and strategy, working to change the way that care is understood and care is developed and delivered. Um, and it's partly to do with starting projects off and then seeing where they join together. So a little bit of background. Um, in the mid nineties, I took over uh, a festival that was a celebration of creativity for older people. And the idea was that there would be projects where older people could be the center of attention. Um, and over 10 years, um, it kind of grew, or I grew it, I suppose. And I grew it in two ways. I grew it by working with lots of different types of organizations. So I'd work with hospitals, I'd work with doctors, I'd work with medical training, uh, I'd work with community groups, I'd work with older people's groups, I'd work with um, housing development organizations and artists and musicians and 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 uh, like somebody said earlier, my job was connecting. It was it was doing all those things that festivals do. Um, promoting, drawing attention, having some fun, uh, bringing a bit of joy. Um, but it was doing it around a particular issue. So in this case, health and aging, but it could be mental health, it could be autism, it could be the idea that you can celebrate something that's difficult and how you go about that opens up different ways of thinking. And once you start to involve lots of different partners or partner organizations, then the connection between those organizations becomes really rich and full of uh, new ideas and potential. And quite often in a festival, what you're doing is showcasing an example. See this thing, it's fantastic. Between festivals, what you're doing is uh, educating, saying look, this is how this is made. This is the long-term impact of this prototype. Um, and it had all sorts of significant uh, effects but I want to focus particularly on one project because it relates to the pandemic. So in 2007, uh, Ireland had an economic crisis and the festival had developed. There'd been a little bit more money every year. And then suddenly overnight, there was a quarter of the money of the year before. And we were two months away from the festival. So we had to sit down and say, okay, what is it we do that's most important? What is the central idea of what we're doing? And we realized that the central idea was joy. We're trying to find the joy in everything that we do. Because from joy comes hope, and from hope comes uh, ways of 
exploring illness and less in the illness. Uh, we also decided that what was critical was um, that people could do things for themselves. They didn't need lots of resources. They didn't need lots of money. They could build from the assets of their own community, from what already existed. Um, and the third thing was that it could be self-designed. So we might have a framework of an idea, but people could take that and adapt it. And so we dreamt up this idea, which became a project called Dawn Chorus. So the idea was that a singing group that existed or could be formed would connect with older adults, learn some songs, decide what those songs were going to be, and then go to, in the first year, a beach and sing at dawn, which was four o'clock in the morning in Ireland. And over the next two or three years, that changed because people said, well, dawn's great, but actually it's too early. Can we do later in the day? We don't live near a beach. We live in the middle of the country. Can we sing by a river or a canal or a, a, a water feature in a shopping centre? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so people started to take the idea and adapt it and play with it and make it their own. And around the rehearsals and the getting up and singing grew this whole other conversation, which was about the impact of a financial crash. And so the older adults had lived through several financial crashes in Ireland, where one day you had lots of money and the next day you didn't. And the younger people hadn't. And so the younger people were afraid of how they would survive. They might have just started families. They would, so life was very difficult. But by making that link between generations, all these unexpected benefits came that were about reducing stress, the trauma of an economic crash building in place. So I tell you that because during the beginning of the pandemic at this time last year, we took that idea and we put it online. And so uh, what that meant was I borrowed resources from arts organizations. So I borrowed song lyrics and little videos. I made a website over a weekend using free, really cheap tools and I'm not a great website designer. Uh, and then I talked to the social organizations and they would download what was available on the website and they would take it to the uh, people that most needed it, isolated older adults, people that were stuck in lockdown, people without any entertainment or any creative distraction. Um, and then at the end of last year, I then worked with the National Development Agency for singing um, who support choirs and wrote a series of documents and made a series of panel discussions and then a series of teaching tools about the aging voice and about how people could what people needed to stay in a choir what they uh, what a choir could do to connect community so the reason for talking you through this project is to show you that quite often you start a project um with a particular idea but as the project continues if you continually assess and reassess and re-examine what's happening in the project then uh, that quite often its impact can grow its potential can grow so you quite often will start in one place and then over time find that the potential of the project um, is perhaps quite different from where you started. So what I'm gonna do now is stop the sharing. We're about an hour in and uh, I want to give you a little challenge. Um, so I want you to get, um, you see, we can do this in two ways. You can either write down on a piece of paper if you've got it, uh, or you can put in the chat. I want you to put, uh, one word which might be uh, an illness or an issue, and then one word or a small phrase which might be the worst art form that you could possibly have for that illness. So illness, issue, challenge, healthcare condition, uh, um, um, social determinant of health, and the worst possible 
art or creative invention. So just for fun, I'm not going to take it seriously. Uh, just interested in what you might do. And while you're doing that, I'm going to catch up with the chat. Great. Okay. Now, India says laryngitis and singing and a choir. Fantastic. Paralysis and what's the art form? Tim Len? Is it so paralysis and dance? So, the most, uh, same time in the same question's not clear. The worst possible what? What's the most inappropriate, most inappropriate art form and condition? Absolutely, the way you shouldn't work. What's the most inappropriate art form condition? Dementia, roller coaster, yeah, crayon, paralysis dance, yeah, upper limbs amputation drawing, yeah, seborrheic dermatitis, yeah, art painting, yeah, okay. So these are. These are ideas that are really bad, the worst possible. Um, worst possible pairing you can think of. Terrible pairings. Blindness photography, epilepsy hair salon, it's scissors, yeah. Drug addiction, paint showing the damage drugs caused to people. Acrobatics and blindness, actually sounds bad. Actually, there are companies like that. Alzheimer's and singing. Mm, okay, maybe. What do you think are the worst pairings? Tremor, piano playing, anxiety, public speaking. Dementia drawing, paralysis painting. Okay. Amputation, football playing. So these are meant to be the worst possible ones, yeah? What is the worst, thanks Oyinda, what's the worst art pairing for a possible known as disability? Lines, juggle, deafness, singing, PTSD, art painting. Interesting. For almost every one of those, I can think of an example where it really works. I can think of choirs for people with Alzheimer's, which work with different areas of the brain. I can think of circus companies for people with disabilities, including people who are blind. I think of uh, juggling company that work with balls that make sound. So they juggle by, uh, by sound. But some of them, um, yeah, process and painting, possibly. Um, what they do show though, what's important I think for this is that they show people started to think about what's appropriate. Okay, next exercise. Um, what's the best painting pairing? So rather than the worst, I'll put it in the chat. What's the best, oops. possible art pairing Oops. and illness or disability. Tracheostomy and singing, blindness, depression, drawing. Okay. Uh, 
anybody want to talk about the best possible pairings? This might be something that you've done already, something that you've tried out. Anybody want to tell us about the project where they've got a, an, an illness, a disability or intervention? Carmen, I can see your hand went up. Did you want to unmute yourself? Or? Franka, do you need yeah. to un yeah, yeah great, yeah. that works. Yeah. Got it, got it. Hi, Dominic. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So, uh, yeah, so the one thing I explore in the area where I work is utilize movement and dance for people with very, people that are very physically disabled and it work. Uh, it work because their movement improve over time and it's not, uh, it can't really be measured because it hasn't been measured, but you can see it. Thank you, Franca. Uh, th thank you, Carmen. Fantastic example. Anybody else uh, that's doing some arts and health projects uh, that would like to tell us a little bit about them? Something that's working. Don't be shy. I, I think Dr. Manel put something in the chat box. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Pediatric oncology patient and patient painted postcards. Uh, postcards were exhibited and sold. <laughs> is it Sahar? Sahar, I really love what you said. There is, there is, everything is possible. Um, and I think that's a really fantastic way of thinking about this. That actually, if you, uh, if you sit back far enough, and think about the challenges that people have in the art form, there is almost nothing that isn't a good idea to try. And one of the things that happens is if you start um, without observing, then what you do is limit the potential of people to have new experiences or to find a way. Um, and that, brings us into the next section. Before I get into the next section though, I'm just wondering, any questions, any thoughts, anything that's that's bubbling up in your thinking from the, the first hour? Anything where you want to go, Dominic, what are you on about? I don't understand. Anything where you go, yeah, that's fantastic. That's the best thing I've heard in six weeks. Uh, anybody? Any, any thoughts? Phyllis is saying that art is powerful. We're all agreeing with Sahar because it's right. Yeah. Anybody, uh, anybody fancy, anybody got a question that they want to ask just before we go on the next piece? I, I sort of addressed it in the chat box, but I don't know if you want to comment on it. There's a fellow that asked, her name is Catherine. She asked, um, what happens when the artist is not at ease with oneself? Can providing different forms of art for others make the person happier? I don't know if you'd like to comment on that as well. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's a little bit like physician heal thyself. Like, it's one of the things at the very beginning of this conversation. When I put up the orange slide at the start and said, you know, the most important thing you can do today is be kind to yourself, because if you're not looking after yourself in your environment, then actually you're not receptive to listening and engaging. And it's exactly the same if you're running a project. If you are, uh, if you are unnecessarily uh, uncertain or stressed or uh, if you are not taking care, of yourself to put yourself in the best possible frame of mind state that you can be in then actually uh, everything else becomes so much harder you're not giving the people that you're working with the best opportunity um, or yourself so i think the the way that i kind of respond to that franco is that it is in 
really important that people think about what you as an individual can do, can manage, uh, what support you have, um, and how you can support yourself through the projects that you might take on. Um, and I think that kind of brings us quite neatly into the next stage. Um, two minutes, give yourselves a bit of a shake. Give your hands a bit of a shake. Yeah, you might kind of stretch them up. Yeah, you might stretch them down. You might give it a little wriggle. You might turn your camera off if you want to give it a wriggle. You've been sitting on a chair for a while, you might roll your shoulders back and the other way. Uh, if you're sitting on a chair like me, you might pick up your legs and just give your feet a little bit of a shake. You might shake all the bits at the same time, your feet and your arms and your head and everything else. Yeah, that's important. Just like get rid of all that stuff. Okay, big breath in. Big breath out. And another one, second one, big breath in. Third and final one, big breath in. How magic is it that all around the world on this call, people are breathing in and out at the same time? Right, the next stage. First part of this is all about examples. Second part is all about tools. I'll talk for probably maybe another half hour. And then I want to try and open it up for questions and, and uh, for you to bring to it whatever complicated question you can think of, because then I really have to think. So we read really into the design bit. So back at the very beginning, I said design thinking, what is it? It's a map. It's a tool for planning and doing. It's a way of organizing your thoughts. And if you go online and look at design thinking, what you will see are things that look like this. They are a series of blocks or tools, often round, and they are a, a linear process. They are visually represented like a linear process. And when you dive into any one of those, you'll have something like this. This one is from the Stanford Design Tool, and it talks about a series of five phases first one empathize second one define third one ideate fourth prototype fifth test and what they're trying to get you to think about is the stages that you will go through as in your case you start to plan an arts and health project so empathize might be about interviewing and shadowing, seeking to understand. Define is about key questions. Ideate is about ideas. Prioritize, prototype, sorry, is about uh, make a version. Test is about trial and error, trial and error, what works. Another way of talking about those is this, and I, for me, this is a little bit, uh, it's not so Stanford in its language. So for me, the, the phases of design thinking are firstly, look and listen. Um, so let's see, somebody said, uh, I want to do a project, or my area of interest is, is uh, people who are nonverbal um, with autism. So the first thing is, well, what is it you can see? How do you look and listen? Do you, do you interview people? Do you question them? Do you take photographs? Do you draw things down? Do you write things? The first phase is really about looking and listening and mapping and reflecting, giving yourself time to understand what it is you can see. And to do that properly, you really need to question yourself. So in the chat, when I said, what's the best, uh, what's the worst possible pairing of a project and a, of a, sorry, of a health condition and an art project, people put as examples. And I could think of, uh, you know, I can think of a circus for people with disabilities. I can think of dance projects for people with, with uh, amputees. And those things exist. So if we just jump to the solution straight away, then actually we're not uh, doing our job properly, I think. 
So looking and listening, mapping and reflecting, looking carefully at what is before us, looking at the issue, looking at the challenges, looking at what happens to people in a hospital or patients in a bed, or is also about looking and listening at ourselves, questioning ourselves, questioning, well, is that really right? Do I think that's right? Uh, is my understanding correct? And very quickly, making a test version. So somebody talked about postcards. What if you quickly make a postcard and see whether they sell, see how you dial them out? Then making another version and then seeing how that works and then looping back again. So you can think of it as observing ideation, making an idea, testing that idea, testing your response to that idea, and then adapting. Make a version, make a better version. What's really important in that first stage though, is that it's a judgment-free zone. So if I, uh, if I, yeah, the, the cry of with the older people in the hospital. If I had uh, looked at the hospital and said, I, before we did the project, I don't think this is possible, then that project would never have started. We'd never have been able to invite people in to sing. If I'd said, mm, I don't think people with Alzheimer's can sing, then I would have stopped that project from, from starting. So the very first bit where you're looking at what the challenge or the issue is that you want to engage with, it really, you need to suspend your judgment. You need to at least be able to say, uh, yes, and if that is possible, yes, and that could happen rather than no, but. And sometimes it's much uh, more effective. It's easier. It's better to do that with other people. So what you're doing is observing, looking at the challenges, looking at the problem, looking at the project, looking at your ideas and trialing that out with other people. And those people really should be uh, the people that you think can benefit. So they might be patients, they might be care staff, they might be, so you're, you're observing, but it's an active process of looking because what you're constantly doing is questioning your own assumptions. Second stage ideation is really about, you have an idea, what if you make a version of it? So um, with the hospital transformation, with the, the murals on the wall, what if you make a model to explain to people what it might be? So you've talked about a hospital not being a nice place. You've seen that these places could be better. You've looked at a particular place, you've taken photographs, you've talked to people about what would make this better. You decide that maybe a mural on a wall is a good idea. And then what if you make a version, not the painting on the wall, but you make a model or you make a series of drawings and then you share it with people. And in the process of doing that, making a version that you can touch, what you'll also find is that you start to understand what's at the heart of your question. So. Do I want to make this more beautiful because people spend an awful lot of time in this building that they're sitting waiting for hours and hours and hours? Or are people just passing through this in a hurry? What's the core question that I'm trying to get to? Um, and then what you might do is test the wall and ask people what they like. Do you like this? Does this work for you? And this constant, in this way of design thinking, there's a constant back and forth between trying something out and then seeing how well it works, trying it out and seeing if it works, trying it out and seeing if it works. So it's a conversation, often through materials, through making the version of something, um, rather than I sit down and I design the whole project and then I go in and I present it to people and nobody wants it. So what design thinking is largely about is giving uh, you a roadmap, a process, so that you can develop projects with people that will benefit from them so that they're sustained and they, they last uh, in their lives. So the simple version of this, the, my love, logic and questions version, uh, 
is that you make a version of what you're trying to do so that you can make a better version. You trial something out, you ask people about it, you make it with people, and then you make a better version. You might make the first version in really cheap materials. You might make a sketch of it. You might make a model of it. You might try it with three or four people. And then you learn from that process and then you make a better version. Um, I'm gonna skip that one, I think. Yeah. So in that first stage, um, we get to this, what is it I'm trying to do? In your own time, I think, you might try this exercise. Take a very simple um, task, like making a cup of tea, and try and explain to someone in a series of drawings or a series of bullet points how you do that. And that process is project planning. Thinking about how you do it better, that's design thinking. And I want to sort of stay with design thinking. So um, can I just ask you to put in the chat, what's the health, oops, we jumped, what's the healthcare or wellbeing challenge that you most want to address? Some of you did it earlier on, uh, but I just want to see whether some of you have, a, have an idea at the moment. What's the healthcare or wellbeing challenge that you most want to address? And can you explain it in a, a short sentence? Maternal mortality. Yeah, that is brilliant. Anyone else beside Juliana? Always back to the beginning. Um, just scrolling back to the start to see um, there were some suggestions at the beginning. While I'm scrolling, uh, see if you can put in. Uh, making life more fun for pediatric cancer patients. Uh, poor health seeking behavior of Nigerians. Accessibility to information. Academic stress in the education system. Uh, I work with children with cancer. Dietitian, I want to ease things for those children. Addressing the stigma around people living or born with terminal disease, drug use and misuse. Oh, we've got some more fantastic. High blood pressure, oh, loads, um, they hadn't all come up. Um, children experience in the journey of requiring medication, depression in young adults, ovarian cancer, behavior of concern in organizations, community groups that offer services for people with intellectual and physical disabilities, older people, depression in children. Can I repeat the question? Yeah, what's the, um, what is the healthcare or well-being challenge you most want to address? And can you explain it in short sentences? You're really good at it, actually. Hair loss in children with cancer during treatment. Engaging individuals to access mental health. Frustrated healthcare workers, personality disorder. Wow, loads of stuff. Fantastic. Engaging individuals who are abused. Healthcare services. Making patients the centre of delivery and design those are fantastic taking care of caregivers yeah fabulous if you 
look through there, it's like a library of ideas and suggestions and important things to do. So um, I'm going to jump back to the sharey screen bit. So we've got lots of ideas. And some people are really fantastic at summarizing them in a short way. For other people, I think getting from the uh, getting from knowing what it is that you want to address an impact to what's the art-based program is a challenge. It's complicated. So the stages of the design process really useful. Knowing about other uh, knowing other people's examples, not having examples that that are a little bit like what you want to do. They're fantastic too. Um, I'm going to introduce you to some other ways of thinking though. So um, Nabil Hamdi is an architect who learns from temporary dwellings, from slums. And he talks about how do you do an intervention? How do you make life better for people in very difficult circumstances, like living in a temporary uh, town? And he uh, talks about this as small change, a series of small changes. And he has a series of, of suggestions. He says, ignorance is liberating. Not knowing that you can't do something is a fantastic freedom. He says, start where you can. Because quite often what happens is we get frozen at the very beginning because we see all the problems that we've got in the future. But they're just problems in our head. We haven't got there yet. We can't deal with them at the very beginning. Start where you can. Imagine first, reason later. Just what is it we could do? Not how do we do it? Just what is it we could do? And to get to there, be reflective, waste time, embrace serendipity, get confused, play with it, play games, play serious games. He also talks about challenging consensus. So he says, consensus, having everybody agree all the time, sometimes isn't very rich and creative. Um, People just sort of agree without actually buying into something. Um, so creativity and life are the result of the tension between those opposite. If you take risk out of every project, then nothing new will happen. Look for multipliers. We talked about the ambassadors. Patients are ambassadors, staff are ambassadors. They're the things that help projects grow. And key to all of this, he says, confusingly enough, but related to what we talked about before, is feeling good. You've got to be excited by what it is you're trying to do. You've got to feel good about it. In the last session, I talked about this project design process as a, as a icing sugar bag that we put all the ideas in at the beginning without any judgment. We're not saying whether it's possible, it's not possible. We've just got an idea. What if we try this? What if we paint it orange, have helicopters, put light bulbs in? We brainstorm, we put all the ideas in, and we're not trying to decide if they're any good. The next stage in the design thinking is the ideation. Well, what if we do it like this? The next stage is selecting the best versions that we can do now. And then the final stage is just doing the project. With the design thinking, you're doing that process of all the ideas, What's the best possible version? How can I make a quick version? How can I make a cheap version? How can I try something out and learn from the process of trying it out? Uh, and then you're doing that in an iterative process. So it's almost like you're going back to, to learn from the beginning again. So I've tried something out. Well, now what can I try? I've tried something out. Now what can I try? Um, let's go back a little bit. Um, no, I don't. So what helps on this journey from, um, from ideas through to project is a series of tools for thinking. I talked about these the last time, and I'm going to touch on them briefly this time, but I've included them because you get this uh, PowerPoint package, you get this to kind of play with. And I've put in for each of these links so that you can understand them, you can spend some time uh, looking at them in your own time and understand them better. 
but they're really useful if you go through the process of observing, of ideating, coming up with ideas, of making a trial version, of trying something out and, and uh, exploring whether it works and then looking to sort of sustain it. So these tools are really useful little project management tools. What's also important is that wherever you are working and whatever circumstance you're working in, you realize that you start from a place of abundance. You start with all the assets that you need to make anything are available in your community, in your place. Um, Conley and I talk about this a lot when we talk about budgets. And he says, Dominic, if I got up in the morning and I looked at how much things cost, we'd never get started. It's quite true here. If I look at the cost of things in terms of finances, many of the projects I do won't start. What they build from, though, is the assets that I've got available in the community. So one of those assets is trying to be clear about what it is you're trying to do. And some of you were just brilliant. You just put up two words or a short sentence about the area that you're trying to explore. And to get from the area that you're trying to explore to the sort of intervention, um, I'd suggest you try playing with it. So uh, there are lots of different ways of doing this, writing sentences and then reducing, reducing, reducing. How can you explain your project in a tweet? Can you draw a banner and describe your project in a drawing? Can you uh, make a two minute journey and tell a friend in a, by use the lift and elevator that you could, uh, how do you explain what it is you're trying to do in the most concise way possible? And that's really important because storytelling is, is a big part of uh, the design process. And the more that you tell the story of what it is you're trying to do, it's almost like you talk it into existence, but you find that you get more and more precise with your descriptions. Um, SWOT analysis, I'm not gonna labor these, I'm not gonna spend lots of time with them. I'm looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats to your project. And really it's a very simple process. You make a, an X. In one place, you put the strengths of your projects. In another, you put the weaknesses. In another, you think about the opportunities. In another, you think about the threats. So each of these is a tool for helping you go through those stages of what is it I can see? How do I, what might my intervention be? What might my art project be? Can I make a trial? Can I make a test version? Can I make a cheap version? What do I learn from that test version? How can I make a better version? For me, what's really key at the beginning is asset mapping. It's asking yourself what you already have that can help you as you try to make your project or your program. Make a list and think about, uh, can you make not necessarily the full project, your full project might be something as complicated as the design and dignity end of life rooms but that might be 10 years in the future at the moment what's the small thing you can do that that can help you walk in that that direction in that general direction how can you try it out can you make something quickly and asset mapping um assets are can be money they can be people they can be time they can be what can i borrow you will all have things already within reach that will be able to help you as you start to think about the projects that you want to do. Um, as you move through this, I find these things incredibly useful. I put a link to what a Gantt chart is. It's basically a planning tool. So uh, the words are all things to do. The little blocks of color are when they will get done and really they're very simple you write down a list of things that you need to do and you put in a block this is a timeline for when it might happen and what you're trying to do is make sure that uh, you can sequence your project in a logical order so observe 
look at the area that you're trying to work in, come up with some ideas, make a trial version, and round about that stage, also think about what can I do now? What do I need to do later? Um, you're really, it's a, Gantt charts are really just a tool for organizing the tasks. Um, budgeting isn't just about money. It's also about what you need. It's thinking with numbers. Um, it goes back to this idea of what can you do now and what do you need to do later? And what do you need to do, what, you need, what help do you need, which might be financial, to make a version of what your project is in the future? Like I said, I'm not going to labor all of these because uh, it would take too much time and I don't think it's a useful use of your time that much. Um, and then finally, the other tool for thinking that's incredibly important is really how do you know whether you've done what you set out to do? Um, if I set out to do uh, an intervention that makes the lives of older adults better, how do I know when I've done it? So that's about evaluation tools and questioning and having a set of questions at the beginning that you go back to. Uh, have I managed to achieve what I set out to do? But it's also about who owns those questions. So in the stage where at the very beginning where you're observing, one of the ways you might observe is by asking people about their experience of a hospital visit or their experience of living with a condition. And if in that conversation, they have better questions than you, start to use their questions. Because what you're doing is then designing a project around the actual needs that people have. Um, and as you do that, what you're also starting to build is a, a library of good questions, um, which will help you navigate uh, your project. Um, risk analysis is really, as you develop your project, what might happen, what might not happen, how do you make it less likely to happen? Not going to stay with it for today. Instead, I'm going to kind of get to this. So right back at the beginning of this, an hour and a half ago, I said, you are all experts in being yourself. You are all the best people at being you. You all work in very different places and contexts. As you start to think about your projects, I think you need to ask yourself three things. What are you good at? What are you not good at? and who can help. And one of the great advantages of fellowships is that you have a living library of resources for other people that can help you. The other thing about designing your project through a design thinking process is that you're not trying to make the perfect version. You're trying to make the best version you can make now. Make a version, make a better version. And in the last section, we talked about this. We talked about making people curious, inspiring them, engaging them, giving them skills and sharing, which I think really is how arts projects really work and arts and health projects really work. When Conley repainted the arts and health hub, people were curious about why that messy building is now pretty. They were inspired by what he's trying to do with it they were connected with that and sessions like this afternoon are about giving people like you the skills sharing the skills so that you can go off and make your own vision and i think this is the way that these projects grow and um, at the end of this you will see uh lots of links uh for you to explore in your own time but i'm going to stop the sharing then i'm going to grab myself a glass of water and I'm going to invite you uh, to ask any questions. I can see there's some things in the chat. Um, so I'll see if there's anything there. But you, thoughts, thoughts, observations. Have I talked you into, um, have I talked you to sleep on a Sunday afternoon or an evening? Dali's going, no, that's good. Thank you, feedback. I love feedback. So strange talking, doing this through Zoom. Um, over to you. Questions, thoughts, observations, uh, challenges, problems. You have me for another 20 minutes. Use me like a living library.
Um, I'm just going to grab a glass of water, but what would you like to know? Nice observation, Eki. These are the basis of business planning, but with a bit more heart. Yeah, they're tools for thinking. The last 10 minutes is really just tools that help you take ideas. And arts and health projects are this wonderful and strange and rich balance of uh, hearts and strategy. Um, yeah. Sorry, I think he's probably has his hand raised. Please ask, I can't unmute yourself and ask. I can't, it'll take me a minute to see you. Couldn't they go? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah, brilliant. I, I, I think um, um, Dominic has done a great job by showing us um, like the, the, the pathway and the methodology on how to like, even start very small and uh, make whatever we say small bigger. And sometimes, you know, sometimes we really want to do something like this and then, but the challenge sometimes that we want to start big, we want to go big, mm -hmm. and sometimes it doesn't work that way. We have to start for as a, as a pilot and then begin to work, evaluate, build, and keep building and before it becomes bigger, right? Um, I was making like few reference to like for our fellows in Egypt, you know, in a way where professionals work in silos, like the psychiatrists probably, you know, the, the, the art and health practitioners there or those who are into art therapy can't really stand alone. So they can leverage like relationship by working with psychiatrists, like, you know, coming together and building a community. Because one of the things you realize that sometimes I've seen that experience here in Nigeria, where people feel like you want to take over their job, so they will resist you. They feel like you are coming to, so they, they feel threatened by your presence. So you, the way you introduce yourself says a lot about whether they will give you access or not, right? So for instance, you can say, oh, my name is Kunle Adewale and um, I love what you do. And I'm here to like support and complement what you do. Um, I can help maybe like, maybe do art session with the people you work with and they just will help you. And I can even like bring musicians to, to come around and play for you. You know, so when people start hearing those words of like, because it's about building social capital, it's about building relationship. So when those relationships are built, barriers are broken because there are barriers in the community. There are barriers in the hospital. How do you break the barriers to be able to connect, to be able to implement some of the ideas you have? Is by building a relationship with people on ground, by starting very small, gradual transition. And then by the time they start seeing the changes, they can't deny you access. They want you to come up. I can give you an example of some of the projects we've implemented in psychiatric hospital. When we started, you know, they didn't, they were, there was no access, kind of. And then, but I kept at it. I kept going back. I kept going back. I kept going back, writing letters. And they saw the time, so they gave us opportunity to do a mirror in the, in the hospital. And then, so when they saw it, like, wow, this is great. They were started, like, inviting musicians to come play for some of the, um, drug addicts at the, um, in the psychiatric hospital, they will realize that some of them are also musicians, those who are in the drug world units. Some of them are musicians. So what, you know what we did? We, take, we took some of the musicians uh, in, the, in, the, in the hospital and we brought in our own professional musician for them to make music together. The, 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 the result was, was powerful. And then there was somebody asked us, are you coming back? Are you coming back? Are you coming back? When, when are we going to see you? So now they want more. Why? Because you've, they've tasted the goodness of what art can do in psychiatry and mental health. And then the nurses and um, occupational therapists people have seen the result of that evidently. And then so also not just on the patient alone, but even they themselves that are working in that space, they are seeing the changes. So now they are placing demand for more. But when we started, it was not that way. We started, it was a gradual transition, right? So we have to think that way 
when we are trying to build a program, we are trying to create a program, start very small. It could be two people, it could be three people, and that's fine. It's okay to start small. And then there's so much lesson you will learn when you start small. It will help you to know how to build a sustainable program because there are less, you will make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes. And then you'll learn how to not to make those mistakes again. And then before you know it, you will build it up. I'll give you an instance. The Art and Medicine Fellowship program we are running today started for us as a pilot program here in Nigeria. We started so small, we made mistakes, we improved on it, and we kept improving on it. Then from there, we, after we, we've done it like three quarters, then we moved it to a Pan-African program. From a local program to a regional program in Africa, then the fifth cohort, we now move it to a global program. But we, we didn't start as a global program. We started very small. So no matter what you want to do, start very small. Because that small thing has a potential of becoming a big tree and a big tree that can become a forest. That's my contribution. Thank you, Conley. It's, it's a great example of uh, those phases, you know, the, the observation. What is it we're trying to do? Can I make a trial version? Can I make a better version? Can I develop it? And at every stage, you're constantly going back and asking yourself, is this working? How do I know it's working? What tells me that it's working? So, you know, the, to the fellowship, partly it's about people turning up like you. It's about people being interested. It's about it develops dynamism and momentum. And, and quite often that's a really good way of thinking about the success of a project is that the project is successful because more people want to do the project. Whereas if you're coming from a medical framing, that might not be um, the only appropriate way. Um, but it's a really useful way if you're, if you're thinking about these projects. Quite often you, they're difficult to analyse uh, because they work on so many different levels at the same time. Whereas if you were doing a therapeutic piece that was quite straightforward that was to do with uh, repetitive action then you can analyze that in a more straightforward way but if you're talking about uh, changing the physical environment it's got so many different impacts on patients on staff on families on uh, the working environment that actually that in and of itself is is a complex thing to try and measure but there are ways of doing it um, I'm, I, we've got about 15 minutes and I'm really curious about things that you might be trying to do um, that you can talk about or would be willing to talk about. And if this fantastic um, living library can kind of help. Uh, so I see a couple of hands. Is it Dahlia? Should you unmute if you can? Hello. Hello. Very lovely hi. to hear you. Hi. hi. Um, well, here in Egypt, we, as uh, Mr. Cornwell said, we have some obstacles about uh, approaching um, group like uh, governmental hospitals, which are the hugest here and stuff. Uh, but I have this idea about, uh, of course, it's something so old in your experience but here in Egypt it's not that known as much as just taking care of the doctors and nurses and staff they are so busy and all the time they don't have the time or the capability to in, indulge in and like uh, self-releasing uh, activities like arts or whatever and they actually they are so overworked that they don't understand the importance of this thing although they are doctors although they took the same <laughs> uh, they, they should understand more but actually it, they are so resistant so so resistant to that so uh, i took for, uh, the idea from uh, sarah about uh, improving their environment much more uh, not asking them to engage in something or that it would be like a burden on them and they won't do it so just uh, making their dorms much colorful putting pictures of open 
uh, areas and nature and stuff like that. This is, it seems to be like uh, a simple uh, old idea, but when you wanna like implement it or go to the hospital and do that, it's all about, we don't have the budget, it is not an, a great idea. If you want to like uh, 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 yani volunteer, that's fine. But it is not that important for them. That's why it is a little bit difficult to think. And you need like um, connections to reach what you want with the uh, yani governmental uh, 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 you know the the bureaucratic stuff, um, but I think Dr. Manel has the <laughs> the capability to help in that. Inshallah. Um, the problem is like how can you convince doctors with no time to do, do other stuff? It's important for your health and mental health to like use art as a relief for yourself. That's right. the thing. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. So um, I can, I, there are three or four things. Firstly, thank you, because um, it's a fantastic uh, and very articulate explanation of, of something that I think is really a big challenge everywhere. And the fact that it's a big challenge everywhere is actually a bonus for all of us, because sometimes I think what happens is... Uh, and I'm sometimes guilty of it, I will go along and say, there's this fantastic project that we should start today. And people are like, yeah, it's no, I don't have the time, I'm too busy. But also, as Kanle was saying, sometimes people feel a bit threatened by that. Yeah. Um, so how do you uh, encourage people to recognize this in a way that they're not threatened? Um, and and I think the way that you realise that you've you are getting somewhere is when other people will tell you about the idea that you introduced to them six months before. Okay, especially men, but they, it's a way of recognising achievement. In the chat, I put a, a piece from a, a doctor called Cyan Brown who is working in South Africa and is uh, looking at staff burnout and. Uh, I've used this video recently. Um, and what I did was I showed it to, to medical doctors. And I said, come see this thing. This thing is happening in South Africa, not in Ireland. It's not in your remit. So it's not like your problem. It's over in South Africa. And so we looked at the film, this is quite short. And then we talked about the film. And by talking about the film, what they were doing was really talking about their own challenges and difficulties but it meant that i wasn't there was no loss of face yeah there was no loss of hierarchy they could talk about this thing that was over there um and if you think about it that it, it's called a significant third so that way of talking about something that's difficult through the through by talking about a film or a work of art or a show it's actually key to some of the things that we do uh, you know, we can we can talk about death and dying because we've seen a film. So that idea that you show people something that is happening somewhere else in order to talk about the thing that you're trying to do here is a good place to start. And it's also, uh, I call it socialising ideas. It's also, Conley talks about it as social capital. It's, it's, you are building networks and friends and collaborators who can help you on the journey. Um, and you're also doing a version of uh, come and see. So um, I love reports. I love uh, research. I read books. They're all great and fantastic. But actually, uh, when my mind gets changed, it's often by something that I see and I, I experience. And then I will justify. And I know as a you know, baby neuroscientist researcher, that that's the way that our brains work. We make an emotional shift and then we justify it. So if I have a beautifully decorated room with lovely curtains, which might be my room, and I've got a lovely bedspread and I've painted it relaxing colors and I have, yeah. 
and I invite some friends over and they go, oh, that's lovely. They've, they've gone through the process of already realizing, and then they will articulate it. And so and I would, you know, it's that idea that you start small, you start with what you can do. I can show a film because it's available on the internet. I can sort out my own space and invite people to see. And I can socialize in the group of friends that I've got that would be willing to go there. And then it just grows. Um, and, and that process of, of uh, Connie and I know this man called Chuck Feeney who said, it's always just people in a room. Um, every decision is just people in a room. So how do you convince those people? And partly it's about showing. The third thing, just while we're still on about that, is I think the time critical piece is things, something that artists don't think about enough when they're thinking about working in healthcare environments. So in Ireland at the moment, uh, it is something I am uh, trying to explore in a really significant way. So I talked to the medical service here and they said, we'd like to do these projects. And they said, they're lovely, but they'll only really affect 20 or 30 people. How do I affect 200,000, 300,000 people that work for the healthcare service? And so we are trying to make uh, 10 minute interventions, little exercises that people might get on their phone. It might be a, like a, a series of questions. It might be the breathing exercise that we did in the middle of this so that we can we can make very very simple uh, a series of four steps that we send to people and uh, they can do that when they have 10 minutes in their day or it might be a little drawing exercise that people do when they have a tea break or it might be so they're tiny 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 interventions in terms of time and they're responsive to the needs of people who are very very time poor um, and I think what's important about them as well is that they recognize that I understand the challenges that people who work in medical health have, that I, I accept their expertise, they recognize their brilliance, I celebrate them, and I want to be able to work with them, not to tell them why they're doing, why they're doing it wrong. So I'm trying to find a way of doing that. Um, fantastic set of questions and observations, I hope that was helpful. Um, anybody else? This is always the best bit. Who else is doing things? What are you doing? What might you be willing to tell me about? Sorry, Clinia still has his hand raised. Yeah, sorry, just to corroborate what uh, Dominic has said. Um, uh, just to add to the question that Dr. Delia asked, um, I try to imagine what we're doing on this side now that um, we now have medical students going to hospital room to do art engagement. Now, I don't, I don't have to go to the hospital room again. Now, so in Nigeria, we have a uh, medical school. Now, some of the medical students of this school are part of the fellowship. Now, they've been taught how to use creativity to support people who are sick. Now, I don't have to go to that hospital or to that school to do the job that they can do. Why? They are like foot soldiers. Even though they are students, they go to classroom. There's something interesting that some of these medical students are actually talented in music, in, in drawing and paintings. Now they found an outlet where they can channel their creativity. Like, you know, like it's not all about books in medical school. I can do something with my creativity. I can sing for a patient. So all those small things really count in the long run because you're building a network, you're building a community. You can start very small. When we started also, I'm, I'm just going to make reference to that. Um, in 2013, when we started doing program with the Sickle Cell Foundation Nigeria, you know, the, the first idea was to like probably think of how the government can accept our ideas, but they are bureaucracy. Like, you know, like the government is not even ready for you. If you keep waiting for the government, you will never achieve anything. You are going to wait for a long time. What can you do without the government? You have to think about that. What are the simple projects you can do without the government getting involved? But in the long run, the government is going to get involved when you have scaled. Because now they are seeing the result of what you're doing. For instance, now this year, we hosted the first National Art and Health Conference in Nigeria. It has never happened before. 
But when we started way back in 2013, working with sickle cell patients, about 10 or 15 of them, we had no idea that one day we will host the national program. The idea was not to host a national program. The idea was to start implementing. So as we started implementing, it started growing. It has a life of its own. So your idea with time will grow, will expand, and it will become something national. And so until that time, keep doing what you're doing very small. Keep building relationship. Some of the doctors you mentioned, like, okay, you go there. Some of the doctors are great singers. They are dancers. How about, like, inviting them in to, like, maybe leverage the skills they have? Because it's all about, like, I, I, apart from being a medical doctor, I can actually sing. How about a particular evening, an evening of doctors singing alone? Some of them alone, I'm telling you, they will be so glad to even sing. And that can be like part of the activities you're mentioning. And that's how to get started. And they probably you can do it maybe once in a month, one hour or 30 minutes. You're not taking too much of their time because doctors are very busy. But with time, they'll be asking that, can we please expand this program to one hour? They will not be the one telling you the time is too short. It's, it's no longer you. You see now, now they are not part, they are players in the ideas that you're coming up with. They are not just one of, they are major players in what you're coming up with. And then they are making input, they are making a contribution because why? They are all players on the same table. In the long run, the, the, the doctors one day might actually carry their guitar, <laughs> which they've never done before. It's a change happening in their minds, but you are, you are steering their mind to possibility of how they can explore what they already have but you, you are helping them to activate. You are an activator, that's what you're doing. And in the long run, one day, the hospital might actually want to host a concert based on what you started. You started with two doctors who can sing. Now there are four, now there are six, now there are 12. You're building a community already. You get it? Sorry, Dominic, for hijacking your No, time. it's good. It's good, I like this. It, it makes more sense if we do it like this. Sides. I get very bored listening to myself. Um, and just, we have a little bit more time. I'm not in a rush. So, and I know some people are like, yeah, maybe I should. Sorry, Dominic. We actually have one more minute to the hour. <laughs> so good. Okay, I'll wrap. Um, just to end, we will send this to you. So you have all the slides and the references and my emails on it if you want to kind of reach out afterwards. I really look forward to seeing what you develop and how it develops. Um, there are a couple of questions we're not going to get to, um, but like Franca says, we're in the hour. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Franca. Thank you, Rodney. Back to you. Thank you very much, Dominic. So much nuggets, so much information to be shared. That was shared for 